Okay, I think we are live. All right, so hello everyone. Welcome once again to the Latin American webinars on physics. Uh, I'm Joel Jones from the PUCP in Peru, and I will be your host today. Um, this is webinar number 122, and we're having uh, Martin Gonzalez Alonso as a speaker. Uh, Martin started his physics career with his PhD at the FIC in Valencia. Uh, and after this, he carried out postdocs at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and at the IMPL in Lyon. He has also been a fellow at CERN and is now back at IFIC as a distinguished researcher. Um, so for this webinar, Martin will review how neutron decay may help us identify physics beyond the standard model. Uh, so we are uh, really happy to have him as a speaker today. Um, now, as usual, before we begin, uh, I'd like to remind all viewers that you can ask questions and make comments via the YouTube live chat system. And these questions will be passed on to Martin at the end of the talk. So having said that, let me now give the microphone to Martin. Hi, Joel. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure to participate in this long uh, webinar series. Shall I start right away? Yes, please. OK. All right, so let me share my screen, which you should be seeing now. So, well, Joel, you said I was going to be talking about neutron beta decay. I will be talking actually about nuclear and neutron beta decay. So more fun. Right. Uh, OK, so this is, let me start with a bit of history because because it's a lot of fun and because it will help uh, to put in perspective uh, the current developments. So uh, beta decays are really, really a trove of discoveries, like uh, many uh, historical discoveries were made uh, looking at beta decays, many Nobel prizes were awarded. I'm gonna review just a few of them uh, with some curiosities. So everything started in 1896 when Henri Becquerel discover radioactivity or uranic rays, as he called them back then. Um, so a couple of years later, Rutherford noted the distinction between alpha and beta rays, and gamma were added later. Um, so um, a few years later, it was established that beta, beta rays were electrons, because at the beginning, not even this was clear, of course, the electron was just discovered a few years before. Um, so at the time they thought it was there was a parent nuclear nucleus that uh, transformed in a daughter nucleus and an electron. Of course, they didn't know about the neutrino. It took uh, around 15 years actually to realize that the beta spectrum was continuous. They, they people thought back then that the beta spectrum should be aligned because this first is a two body decay and also in analogy with alpha with alpha rays. But this turned out to be very difficult experimentally. And, and it took like, uh, as I said, like 15 years to, to notice like the spectrum was this, this kind of thing that I'm plotting here. This was discovered by Chadwick. It's actually interesting that in, in a letter to Rutherford, he wrote, there's probably some silly mistake somewhere. I mean, so that shows that the, the, what people were thinking at the time, he was really, really not expecting this. So we all know that Bohr uh, tried to say, uh, he, he said maybe energy is not conserved. Actually, I learned recently that he tried to explain it also with gravitational waves. Don't ask me exactly what he did, but uh, he had some work on that direction. And of course, we all know that uh, around nine, on 1930, actually on the 4th of December of 1930, in, in the famous letter, Pauli postulate, postulated a neutrino, okay, which he called a desperate remedy. Uh, actually, he called it neutron in the letter. And he was actually trying to solve more problems at the same time with this new particle. He was actually introducing a particle that, that somehow was playing the role of a neutron and the role of a neutrino. So, because the neutron was not discovered yet either, uh, which of course doesn't work, right? You need something that on one, on one hand interacts very strongly and on the other one interacts super weakly. So, so that didn't work, but 
but the idea was that one. Uh, we, we all know about this letter, this proposal, he became very famous also for other, for other contributions. But I think it's, uh, it's a curiosity to show how Pauli was also not convinced about this solution. See, not only he called it a desperate remedy, but then in a letter, like eight days after, after that famous uh, letter, he wrote, I myself do not quite believe in neutrons. Again, these are the neutrinos. I've been thinking about a failure of the energy law in case the neutron idea might turn out to be wrong. So you see, he, he was also uh, considering the, that energy was maybe not conserved. Even uh, like uh, almost a year after that, that letter, in 1931, he uh, visited Rome for a conference and then he wrote in a letter, Fermi asked me to talk about my new idea, but I was still cautious and did not speak in public, only privately. So he didn't even want to talk about the, the neutrino thing in public. And he didn't talk about it in public until 1933. So uh, two or three years later after the letter. And actually in that, there is a letter in that, in that year where he said, once again, I believe very much in the energy law. And, and just to close a little bit this story, in 1932, the real neutron was discovered by Chadwick. And then the, the uh, Pauli's neutron was renamed neutrino by Amaldi and Fermi, and that's what we all remember. Um, so in, in 1934, then there is the very important paper by Fermi, uh, where he introduces the weak interaction. This is really, really where the theory is introduced, the theory that we know today. Uh, he, because Pauli thought that the neutrino was inside the nucleus before the decay. Now here is the really the big change. He said, no, the final particles are actually created. They were not inside, they, were, they didn't exist before. And as a curiosity, uh, this paper uh, was rejected by nature because it contains speculation too remote from reality, which I think is, is, is amazing because the paper is really impressive. If you, if you, even today, uh, the paper is, is amazing. Okay, then there was the whole discussion during many, many years about what is actually the, the, the Lorentz structure of the, of the interaction. Uh, Fermi uh, thought it was, uh, or he introduced the interaction as a vector interaction in analogy with electromagnetism. But actually quickly people realized, Gamow, Teller, real, Gamow and Teller, they realized that that was not possible. You also need either axial or tensor to explain some, some selection rules, some decays. And then there was a whole discussion about scalar tensor. What was the structure? There was a lot of confusion. They thought it was a scalar and tensor. Um, actually, uh, during four years, between 35 and 39, uh, derivatives, uh, there was a theory by Konopinski and Ullenbeck, the KU theory, uh, that introduced derivative, derivative interactions uh, to explain the spectrum because there were some measurements which were affected by some systematics and, and then with the, with the non-derivative interaction, those measurements were, they, one couldn't explain them. So then uh, Konopitsky and Ullenbeck introduced derivative that works so for, for several years. People thought that was the right theory. Of course, in the end, that was clarified. And in 56, 57, uh, then we learned that parity was not conserved. It was a very huge uh, discovery and people started to work with the entire Lagrangian, all possible terms at the same time, scalar, vector, tensor, axis, pseudo-scalar, and, uh, and you know, trying to understand from data what was the right answer. Uh, also in 57, the combination of vector and axial was proposed uh, by Marsak, Sudarsan, Feynman, and Gelman. And after some confusion, it was shown that, that this was able, this combination was able to fit the data. Now it's important to say, that uh, so the data was not terribly precise at the time. Uh, that's in part why there was confusion. And there was never, as far as I know, there was no fit carried out with all couplings at the same time. So there is a difference between putting vector and axial and checking that it works and putting all interaction and checking that the data is telling you that only vector and axial are non-zero. Um, that, that was not done as far as, far as I know. Um, so just uh, you know, on 1956, uh, the neutrino is that was detected, Cohen and Reigns, and just uh, I checked because I didn't know, and Pauli was alive, so he died two years later, so he saw that the neutrino was discovered. 
Um, and then, okay, now we fast forward to the future, to the present. We know that the standard model was developed, the electroweak theory that we'll know and study. And, and then we know that what happens actually in a beta decay, when you look at the underlying level, uh, is a, looks like a contact interaction between quarks, up, down, electron, and antineutrino, which is generated by a three-level exchange of a W boson. This is, this is what we know. Now, what we want to look for now these days is for additional interactions, additional contributions on top of the W. If there are other new particles, they would also contribute to this decay and they would generate the small, small effects. So beta decay has become a precision field because you're looking for very small effects. Uh, you need precision both theoretically and experimentally. So somehow we are playing the, exactly the same old game. So, we, but we're looking for small contribution on top of the dominant vector uh, and axial vector interaction, okay? Now, when you wanna play this game, there are two roads you can take. Uh, you, you need to choose your, your theory framework. And one possibility is to choose a specific new physics model and analyze the data in that model. And the, the other approach, which is the one I will follow, is what nowadays we call effective field theories, which is essentially the same old approach, okay? You put all interactions that are compatible with some symmetries, and, and then you use data to constrain, uh, to constrain that, those interactions, okay? Now, once you have a theory framework, then you can compare different probes. You can say whether beta decay is competitive when you compare them with pion decay or with proton-proton uh, to electron anti neutrino at the LHC. Because you know, if there's anything, uh, if there's anything going on here, some non-standard contribution, in principle, you expect that same contribution to produce effects in these other processes. Okay. But this depends a little bit on the theory and in the EFT you parameterize in a general way. Okay, so. About the EFT, I'm not going to say much. Uh, just, just very roughly, the idea is that you have some new physics at a very at a scale that is much higher than the scale that you're actually probing in your experiment. And then those new particles, when you're describing lower energies, uh, processes happening at lower energies, then you don't need to put the particle on shell and you just have an, a few additional interactions, okay? So all the physics is captured by some coefficients that are called Wilson coefficients and which are um, functions of the couplings and the masses of the new theory, okay? This is model dependent, but this is not model dependent, okay? So essentially effective field theory is just you assume what are the fields in your theory, what are the symmetries, you put all possible interactions and you use data to, to set constraints on them, okay? Is model independent, is not assumption independent. Now, the most famous example is uh, muon decay or beta decay, which we're going, we're going to discuss. Uh, you know, when you have the, the W, but at low energies, you just have the Fermi interactions, okay? And the Fermi constant is the Wilson coefficient. And as you can see explicitly here, is a function of the couplings and the masses. And the same, you should keep this in mind if you're not familiar with EFTs, you should keep this in mind when you're during my talk, when you're looking these alphas or epsilon, any Wilson coefficient that I will, I will have is a function of some underlying parameters in a, in a given theory. Okay, so uh, now I'm interested in comparing and combining experiments, okay? If you want to compare different nuclear beta decays, what is the right EFT? Well, the right EFT, the defective theory that you want to use is the EFT at the Hadron level, because you know that nucleus, nuclei, are made out of protons and nuclei and, and neutrons. And then you, you can, you have this, this uh, underlying interaction which should be able to explain them all, okay? This is a language that will, will be common to all beta decays. Now, if I want to compare, for instance, with pion decays, then this, this is not, uh, I cannot use it, right? Because here I don't have pions. So what I have to do, I have to go one step up in the theoretical descriptions. And, and then I have to work with the quark level, uh, the underlying quark level effective Lagrangian. Okay, so now instead of having proton and neutrons as here, I'm gonna have the up quarks and the down quarks. Okay, and then again, you put, this is the leading interaction, the standard model one, and then you have all possible other interactions. Now this step is non-trivial because there is the hadronization in between. Okay, 
So these capital C's, these Wilson coefficients, are connected with the quartz level Wilson coefficient schematically in this form, okay? So you have the phone factors, which are hadronic, hadronic physics, and this is complicated. Now, what happens if I want to compare my beta decay bound with LHC experiments? Then this Lagrangian is not okay because I don't, this is only valid at low energy. So I have to use the effective Lagrangian at the electroweak scale. So I have to introduce Ws, Z, Hxs, et cetera, which is the so-called, these days goes by the name of standard model EFT. Okay. And, and this one, people call it weft or left, is the weak uh, EFT or left 100 EFT, low energy EFT, sorry. Um, okay, so let's get started. Let's look at this uh, hadronic Lagrangian, hadronic EFT. You have proton, neutrons, electron neutrinos. This was the one that was, you know, I, I mentioned before, back in the old days, people were using, were trying to constrain it. Now, nowadays we know that uh, weak interaction is, has a chiral character. So uh, it's more convenient to rewrite it uh, in a way that you have on one hand, left-handed neutrinos and on the other hand, right-handed neutrinos, okay? So we'll have a vector axial scalar tensor and pseudo-scalar coupling with left-handed neutrinos and the same phi coupling with right-handed neutrinos. And there's nothing else. The, the next term in the EFT are derivative terms, which are very suppressed, etc. Okay, so now the theory here, the idea is that you take this Lagrangian and then you calculate your observables. Your observables will be functions of these Wilson coefficients and then the, of nuclear parameters, in particular the Fermi and gamma Teller matrix elements, okay? Now, for some transitions and for some observables, these nuclear matrix elements, they cancel, okay? Maybe because it's an asymmetry or maybe they are very, they are well known using some uh, isospin symmetry and uh, or other uh, methods. And then for those observables, uh, the, the observable is just a function of the Wilson coefficient that we want to determine, okay? Those are the observables that in, are, are interesting if you're looking for information about the fundamental physics. <clears throat> so, uh, of course, there are some small corrections to this expression, but uh, if you choose your observable wisely, uh, then these small corrections are calculable, are indeed small. And also you, you need to choose the observable in a way that the measurements are very precise, okay? That there are precise measurements, okay? So most of the uh, work that has been done in the last decades in this field are either uh, carrying out the measurements, of course, which are these days very precise. I'll talk about them now. Uh, and also understanding the, the ultraviolet meaning of these Wilson coefficients. So how do we compare, how do we connect this coefficient with underlying physics? How do we go through the whole hadronization process, um, radiative corrections, connect with uh, other uh, EF, work level EFTs, et cetera. So I'll talk about it now. Okay, so this slide is about the data. Okay, this is the let's say traditional data that is used in this kind of analysis. Uh, so you can, let me just say, I'm not gonna go number by number, but you can see that the precision is between 0.01 and 1%. So it's really, really, really precise measurements. Now we can classify this into groups. Here we have uh, uh, nuclear decays that are either pure Fermi or pure gamma teller. And then, the, as I said, the, the matrix element either cancel or are well known. So we have on one hand the corrected FT values, which is like half lives, if you want, for a particle physicist. And we have correlation coefficients, which are like angular asymmetries, more or less. And then uh, this is uh, neutron data, uh, which is the same, the lifetime, and then some asymmetries, okay? <clears throat> So uh, let me mention that this is actually not only experimental data, there is also theory input here because this corrected FT values in particular has special importance in these corrected FT values because they are very, very precise. And, and you want a quantity that is nuclear independent, transition independent, and there are some contributions that are transition dependent. And then those contributions, you have to remove them and, and they have to be calculated theoretically by nuclear physicists. Okay, so it's, there is some 
uh, nuclear theory input in these measurements. Okay. Now there are many developments in, in this uh, concerning these measurements or these uh, calculations that have been done in the last uh, few years. Just to mention some of them, that's the Perkeo three measurement of, of capital A, uh, and then also aspect, which measure one of these angular one of these asymmetries in in the neutron decay. And there were many, I will discuss this, this theory contribution concerning the nuclear connections. But just, just to say that there are, this is an active field with um, several groups uh, working on it. <clears throat> now, uh, the previous slide was more about the traditional data used in this analysis. Now, now I want to discuss briefly the so-called mirror beta decays. What are these mirror beta decay? Okay, these are uh, a decay where the parent and the daughter nuclei, they are members of the same isospin doublet, and uh, they exchange the number of protons and neutrons. For instance, neon 19. You have 10 protons and nine, ne and nine neutrons. And the final state, you have fluorine 19 with nine protons and 10 neutrons. So you see they exchange, uh, like, like in a mirror, the number of protons and neutrons. Okay. This, uh, so these transitions are interesting because you have many very precise uh, measurements of the FT values. Now, here uh, also the, the small corrections are uh, can be calculated with more precision because of this uh, um, mirror character. Now, the problem here is that the matrix cell, the nuclear matrix cell, and they do not cancel. Okay, they uh, so you have to keep them in the analysis. But all you need to know is this ratio, the ratio of the gamma teller to the Fermi matrix element, one quantity per transition. Okay, so it means that you need two observables per transition. One observable will fix the correlation if you want, and the other observable will be, you can use it. Uh, so one observable will fix the, the, this ratio, this nuclear ratio, and the other observable will be useful for fundamental physics. Okay. Now, uh, this was actually studied in the standard model to extract VUD uh, in, this, in this nice paper of 10 years ago or so, uh, with very high precision. It's not competitive because the other extractions are even more precise, but this is a test at the 10 to the minus 3 level of the VUD value. And it's not competitive these days, but this is uh, it's improving. Now, uh, it was not done a similar analysis uh, once you introduce beyond the standard model physics, and this is what we wanted to address in this in this work um, that we finished a few months ago. And uh, so, what are I mean? We wanted to quantify what is the information that is brought by this mirror transition. Are they useful? Are they constraining more? Uh, are they telling us something about new physics? And this is what I will discuss um, in the at some point in the talk. Um, so now I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to add these mirror decays, which is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, these six mirror decays, I'm going to add them to our data set. And again, for each transition, I need the FT value, which is again, more or less the half-life, and then some correlation coefficient. Okay. Um, also in concerning mirror decays, there are also some new results, which is, is good. Also, by the way, I forgot to mention, there is also a couple of measurements that appear uh, concerning neutral data after our work. They are still preprints, and they appear after our work was published. Uh, in particular, this, the most precise measurement of the neutron lifetime appear afterwards from the UC and Tau collaboration. So I, it is not part of the feed, doesn't change, any, uh, doesn't change anything dramatically. It's just improving the bounds that I'm going to present. But if you want me to comment on it, I have a backup slide on that. Okay, so now you have to choose your theory framework, the, the, the theory framework that you're going to use to analyze that data set. Okay, first let me start to, to warm up, and because it's interesting, of course, let me start uh, with the standard model. Okay, what does it mean at the, at the heronic level? It means that I'm going to keep only vector and axial vector interactions. Okay, all the others are set to zero. Okay, so I I calculate the observables, I do the fit, traditional fit to that data set that I explained, and this is the result. So you are able to constrain on one hand, vector, an axial vector, uh, hadronic interactions, 
And then you have all this nuclear uh, information that also the data is telling you. Okay, so let me focus on this. Uh, uh, let me let me focus on this first. Uh, on this on the hadronic parameters. Um, so you have this is the Lagrangian that we have, the one that I showed before, only vector and axial vector, proton, neutron, electron, neutrino. Both of them are generated in the standard model. Okay. Now, the idea is I want to connect these to, with, to, with particle physics, with uh, quark level quantities. Okay. Now, this is the Lagrangian at the, at the quark level at three level. Okay. This is the Lagrangian at three level up, down, electron, neutrino. Now, at this level of precision that you see here, which is extremely precise, uh, you need to take into account some corrections, okay? The, these are the so-called matching uh, equations between the two effective field theories. So here you have them. So on the left-hand side, you have uh, the Wilson coefficients of the um, hadronic EFT. And on the right-hand side, you have uh, part of, uh, particle physics parameters if you want, okay? So it's VUD. These are hadronic charges. Uh, I'll talk about them later. These are radiative corrections, small correction from, from loops. And this is the Fermi constant, right? One over V squared, this is the Higgs wave. So one over V squared is the, is the Fermi constant. So this is the VUD times G Fermi, as, as we all know. Okay, so now what does it mean that I can trivially translate this information about CV and CA? On information about VUD and GA, because GV we know theoretically is one up to super tiny correction, negligible corrections. And once someone calculates these radiative corrections, uh, which people have done in these works recently, then you have all you need uh, to translate this to, to VUD and GA, which is a language much closer to particle physicists. So this is the value of VUD, which is the best value available for this quantity. Uh, and, and here I showed you just how the different inputs in our data set uh, fare against each other. So the, the pink band is the, is the average, the one that we obtain. Then you see the, the value, the interval you get from zero plus to zero plus transition. This super allowed decays that were those I showed uh, in, the, in, the, in the slide with the data set. And uh, those clearly dominate this structure. Neutron decay is getting quite close. This is still not so precise. Mirror decays, uh, even if they are very precise per mid level precision, they are not uh, competitive in this game. And this is just each mirror transition. So you see that actually there is this one that dominates mirror, mirror decays. Um, so I have uh, one slide about uh, how the different radiative corrections enter uh, in this extraction, in super allowed decays. Uh, since uh, I think I'm not doing very well with the time, I'm going to skip this slide. And if people are interested, I'm happy to come back to this in the uh, questions session. Okay, so let me skip this slide. And, and let's keep, uh, let's stay where we were. So now let's talk about the other quantity that we are extracting in this standard model feed is GA, this is the axial charge. What is the axial charge? It's essentially this hadronic matrix element. So you have a quark current that you need to hadronize. So you have a neutron that is transforming in a proton through this current, through this quark current, okay? This is a non-perturbative quantity. And, and it's been extremely challenging to calculate this in the lattice during decades, okay? But recently, um, this has become more and more precise and the different effects are better under control. There was this, uh, for the first time, there was a 1% uh, calculation in the lattice of this quantity, like a lot collaboration. Uh, this was sort of criticized by this other collaboration. And if you look at the flag, which is a sort of a lattice averaging group, which with members of, of, of these collaborations included, for the moment, they decided to increase the error a little bit. But I think the main story here is that uh, now we are starting to calculate this axial charge with high precision, and apparently we can go below 1% soon, okay? Um, and of course, this is much more, the experimental value is much more precise than what the lattice can do, and that will be very difficult to, to beat. So for, if you want for the lattice, this is just a cross-check at this point. 
because the number we know in the standard model, we know the value. So if we are in the standard model, we know the value from the experiment, and this is just a cross check. We see that that changes if you introduce a new physics. And okay, the feed, the standard model feed also gives you a lot of all this very precise information about this nuclear matrix element, which is, of course, in, in interesting for nuclear physicists. Okay, let's move on. Let's uh, abandon the standard model and let's introduce uh, new physics. Let's introduce only the terms that involve left-handed neutrinos, okay? So um, I remove all these terms with right-handed neutrinos. I'll talk about them later. Uh, this is what uh, the theory that we are obtaining is, is in the end is the so-called weak EFT or WEFT, which comes from instance from the SMACT, okay? In case you're in, uh, um, familiar with that, those EFTs. Um, now, in principle, we have five interaction, vector, axial, scalar, tensor, and pseudo-scalar. Now, uh, I'm gonna, traditionally, uh, since the 50s, or no, even before, uh, the pseudo-scalar interaction is uh, removed because uh, in the so-called recoil expansion, which is essentially a momentum expansion, uh, this gives a zero contribution. There is no leading contribution, okay? So it enters only at the sub leading order in that expansion, okay? Uh, this at the hadronic level, this is correct. This is justified indeed because of this argument. Now, there is actually a small detail is that when you try to connect this uh, Wilson, uh, hadronic level Wilson coefficient with the quark level uh, Wilson coefficient, you find that there is a huge enhancement, which actually comes from the pion. It's a sort of chiral enhancement which almost compensate the, the, the kinematic or recoil suppression that I mentioned before, okay? So this argument is, uh, is uh, delicate, uh, but okay, we can still neglect this term because we have super, super strong bounds on these pseudo-scalar interactions from pi on decay, okay? Much, much more stronger than we will ever get from, from beta decay, okay? So with that argument, we can still claim this coefficient has to be really, really, really tiny and negligible. So we we'll drop it as well as, as has been always done. Uh, by the way, uh, even if you have right-handed neutrinos in your theory, only assuming that the couplings are relatively small, it will be justified to drop them as well because they do not interfere with the standard model. So their contribution, the contribution from all these red terms to the observables will be quadratic in this C's. So this C's, if these uh, capital C's are small, then uh, the contribution to the observable can be negligible, okay? So this is, I'm presenting this as EFT with left-handed neutrinos, but actually uh, is more valid than that. Okay, so this is the our theory, four Wilson coefficients instead of two. Now, let me say, just to give you an idea of the physics here, like, of course, here, you know, there is a standard model contribution. Now you can also have some non-standard contribution hidden, the same for the axial vector. Now, scalar and tensor were zero. They are, they are new terms with new Lorentz structure. And as such, they affect the angular distributions and the spectrum, okay? So this is an angular distribution in a beta decay, the generic formula. And then in particular, at the linear order, uh, you obtain this so-called fixed term this little b, which is zero in the standard model, which is a combination of scalar and tensor. Okay, so if you have a scalar and tensor, like for instance, from left of work models, um, then they will generate this energy dependent in the energy dependence in the, in the spectrum, okay? Since this is the main, uh, the main handle on them, let's see, let me discuss how you can, how it affects the experiments, okay? There are three ways that this quantity, if present, if, if it's present, there are three ways it affects the observables. One is a direct effect in the spectrum. You clearly see that this, is, this depends on the energy. So if you look at the spectrum very precisely, then you would see a distortion, okay? This is very difficult to do experimentally, but there are some efforts, on, some ongoing efforts. Um, now you, you have to be, not every transition is good for this. Uh, if the endpoint is very low or very large, then you lose sensitivity. So there is some optimal endpoint. 
but okay, I, I will not enter into details here. Now, there is also the indirect effect in the asymmetries. If you measure an asymmetry like capital A, the famous asymmetry measured by, by Bu, where, C, where parity violation was, was discovered. Um, so then you, are, you think you're measuring the asymmetry, but you're actually, you have this little contamination in the denominator. So this is another handle. It affects asymmetries. And finally, if you integrate over energy and over angles, and you obtain the half-life, uh, the width, the total width, then this does not integrate to zero. It gives a finite contribution. So looking at the half-lives, you can also set an effect. So in other words, this first term modifies the neutron lifetime. It modifies the FT, the nuclear FT values, and it modifies them in a transition-dependent way. So you would, you would find a certain trend when you plot them, which we don't see. And then it means that it has to be very small, okay? Um, okay, so using, this is just to give you an idea how the different observables that we included in the fit, how they are sensitive to, to this uh, parameter, okay? Now you put that in the fit, the fit takes into account all that, and this is what we obtain. These are the, the values of the vector, axial vector, scalar and tensor. So you see the constraint is, is very, very strong. They have to be at least three orders of magnitude weaker than the weak interaction. And of course, we'll also fit in all the nuclear stuff that I showed before, but I'm not showing it again, but it's in the fit. Now, let me just say that in this fit, uh, mirror decays, now we can assess their importance. In this fit, they are not, they are, they are completely, they're not playing any role because this is the constraint on scalar and tensor from the whole fit. And this is the constraint only from mirrors, okay? So they, are, they, they cannot compete because neutron and the super allowed decays are way too precise. They are a nice cross check, but they cannot compete. Um, now we do the same exercise of translating this hadron level Wilson coefficient to particle physics quark level quantities. Now, um, sorry, one second. So this is for the vector one. This is the new matching equation. Now you have this, this non-standard vector contributions, for instance, from a W prime. So you cannot extract VUD. You can only extract this combination, which I'm gonna call VUD hat, um, which you could co constrain using this kind of CKM test, CKM identity test. But anyway, from a beta decay point of view, you get the number and that's all you have. Now, concerning the other structures, uh, if I want to go from this capital C's to this epsilons, from this capital C's to this epsilons, I need to know the value of these of this nucleon charges. So here you see that the lattice input for GA and also for the same one with scalar and tensor currents is crucial. If I don't know the value of GA or the value of GS, I cannot go from C to Epsilon, okay? So in this sense, the, the lattice calculation of GA is not a, it's not a cross check anymore. It's really a needed input for this, for this um, to proceed. Okay, so now using G, the GA I discussed before, one is able to set a bound on these right-handed interactions and the same using other lattice calculations of, of for the scalar and tensor charges, uh, you can translate also these bounds up here to these quark level bounds. Now in this language, you can now compare, for instance, with radiative pion decay, which is also sensitive to the same tensor interaction, okay? And then you can make this kind of plot. You can plot the constraint from radiative pion decay and the constraint that I just showed from beta decay, and then you can you know, make your conclusions and, and your projections. Okay, one second. Yeah, so if now I want to go to even higher energies, as I said before, now I need to match to the higher, higher energy EFT, this, this MEF. okay? Now this is what I'm describing in this cartoon slide, but I already uh, mentioned that before. So the idea is just to match again to EFTs to translate my epsilon into alphas. These are the EFTs of the low, the, the Wilson coefficient of the low, EF, low energy EFT. And these are the Wilson coefficients of the high energy EFT. 
Uh, let me skip these. These are just the exact form of those matching equations that we don't, it's just the translation, the dictionary, how to go from one EFT to the other one, okay? Now, uh, you can also, in the EFT, you can, of course, uh, take into account running and mixing on off operators. All these um, have been studied in recent years. So beta decays are able to, to give you access to very few of this EFT coefficient. This MEFT has an, a huge number of Wilson coefficients, and the beta decay is giving you access to a specific corner of them, okay? So again, now, now that you have put your bounds, this language, this high energy language, then now you can compare with LHC bounds, for instance. You can search for the same interactions at the LHC. And for instance, looking at this process, proton, proton to electron neutrino, which is essentially beta decay in a collider, if you want. And, and then you can compare, okay? Not gonna enter into details, just wanna flash you the result, give you an idea, but you see that these are scalar interactions, these are tensor interactions, the standard model, of course, there is zero. From, uh, from this charge current search, uh, uh, electron neutrino in the final state, you get this blue line, which you see is comparable with the limit we obtain from beta decays. So these are uh, experiments carried out at energy scales that are separated by orders of magnitude. And you see, it's, I think it's nice to put them in the same plot and to be able to compare them. So they're, they're probing the same region, more or less. So now you can now say, I'm gonna switch on, uh, all the coefficient, which was never done, all the coefficients. So we're back to 1956. We're gonna finish the work that was left unfinished. Uh, so we're gonna put all these um, uh, eight coefficients at the same time. And I'm gonna let data tell me what is the result, okay? And this is, oops, there's a problem here. This slide, okay. So, um, so this is the result of the field. The field becomes non-Gaussian because now you have quadratic dependencies. But anyway, you can deal with that. And then the, the bounds, of course, the precision of the structures becomes smaller because you have more parameters, of course. But you see it's still very high. You see that the, the bounds on these are the, these are the Wilson coefficients of the operators involving left-handed neutrinos, those that we already had in the previous field. And these are those with right-handed neutrinos, which we didn't have and we're switching on now. And these are all put together at the same time, okay? And of course, you also have the nuclear mixing ratios that are also fitted simultaneously, but I'm not showing, okay? Now, what is interesting of this big fit is that now if I don't put mirror decays in the data set, then I get the blue lines. So you see, for instance, for the vector uh, Wilson coefficient, I get this blue line. If I include mirror transition in the data set, I get the red line. So you see that in this big fit, the input from mirror transition is very useful, is very important. It makes a difference, okay? And it's the same for almost all, for almost every Wilson coefficient is the same conclusion, okay? Now, if you pay attention to this one, tensor to the tensor uh, Wilson coefficient, uh, you see that there is actually a, a tension with the standard model, it's a 3.2 sigma tension. Um, so I wouldn't get too excited about it because, uh, so you see that adding mirrors or not, in this case, is not very important in this particular case. Um, wouldn't get too excited. So first, because it comes essentially from one measurement. So if I remove aspect, the measurement by the aspect collaboration in 2020, uh, then it goes down to 1.8. And then there was a measurement by ACORN collaboration uh, after our paper was published. And if you add it to the fit, this 3.2 becomes 3.0. So it becomes a little bit smaller. So it doesn't increase the, the anomaly. So it's probably just some statistical fluctuation or some uh, small error being underestimated. Uh, so anyway, now you can repeat the, the game. You can say, I'm gonna translate this information into uh, quark level information on, that is BUD and this epsilon coefficients. So I'm, I'm not gonna do it here, but you, I think you understood the, the logic of the, of the process. Let me uh, skip to this slide. I mean, you can just 
we did some benchmark. We say what happens if in the middle decades they can become, they can reach this precision, what will be the impact on BUD? So this is just making some extrapolations and projections that are useful for the experimental community. Um, and let me just uh, wrap up, I think in time. Uh, so uh, I think it should be clear that we have per mil or even sub per mil level precision in beta decays. This is a great laboratory for not only for particle physics, but for nuclear and hadronic physics as well. Um, I put the emphasis more on particle physics, but you saw that we have nuclear matrix elements that we are extracting from data. We have hadronic uh, charges or matrix elements that we are extracting from data, comparing with lattice. Uh, there are also subleading effects that I didn't discuss. There's a lot of physics in here. Uh, I hope you got the idea that there is progress in all fronts. Uh, there is progress concerning lattice QCD, radiative corrections, even I didn't enter, sorry, into much detail. There's a lot of work concerning radiative corrections recently. Of course, a lot of exper important experimental progress. And there is a lot of progress concerning the uh, application of effective field theory techniques, the matching to underlying EFTs, the running, the mixing, comparison the, with other probes, comparison with pions and LHC, I show it. And one can even study the, the interplay with neutrino oscillations, which I, I didn't discuss, but I want to, to mention it. And I think uh, an important message is that when you translate beta decay to this uh, high energy language, uh, it's clear that beta decays are competitive probes of TeV physics, okay? Even if this is very, very low energy processes, through a very high precision, they are able to be sensitive to physics uh, with that natural underlying square, underlying scale. And, and just as a last conclusion, uh, as a last message, is that these mirror decays, um, they're, they're not competitive if you have very few parameters in your fit, but when you're trying to do a very general fit, uh, then they become crucial, okay? So they're very useful in that, in that context. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Okay, super. Thank you very much for the very nice and very clear talk. Um, so, okay, uh, okay. So Orlando has raised his hand. So let's let's uh, give him the mic. Please, Orlando, go ahead. Uh, hi, I, uh, I, I like your talk. It was very clear. I want to ask something. Uh, there's some proposals to do some better beams in many Europe. Did you think if you can use these beta beams to constrain even uh, more these uh, new coefficients? So I didn't understand what are the proposals to use, which- We are using a beta beams to produce neutrinos and then study oscillations. They are- ah, so the, in at, the European, at the European spallation source, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, think, I mean, at the European Spallation Source, there are um, experiments that have been proposed to measure some of the quantities that I have discussed, in particular neutron decays, uh, correlation coefficients and lifetimes, to measure them much more precisely. So it would have a big impact on this, uh, on this fit. It would increase the, uh, it would strengthen the constraints, or you could discover something, of course. Okay. Right. Super. So, um, any 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 other questions from um, from all other people here? Yeah, Nicolas. Hey, thanks, Martin, for the super nice talk. Uh, I got confused at the very end when you show, uh, you, you say that you were scanning over these eight uh, uh, coefficients, right? Yeah. But but then in exactly in this plot that you show here and in the one next plot, are you just are you marginalizing over just one or? I'm marginalizing over all the others. I'm not setting them to zero. I'm just marginalizing over them. So they are they are present. Okay. Okay. I see. And in this last table, if. This last table is just how much the, the bound that you obtain 
on this particular uh, uh, Wilson coefficient, but the others are also present. So I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's just how much the blue interval improves when it becomes red. So what is the, ah. the ratio? It's just how important are mirrors? How, what okay. is the improvement that they bring for this coefficient is an improvement of a factor of 2.8 uh -huh. for this other is 2.8 okay. also. And, and so on, just to show that the improvement is more just general it's not just affecting this particular Wilson coefficient. But all these uh, numbers and plots were done with all uh, parameters present, not only these eight parameters, but also the six mixing ratios in the nuclear quantities that are so floating. Okay, okay, okay. Of course, okay. now if you take this chi square and then you set to zero, for instance, these four, uh, these four Wilson coefficients, then you reproduce exactly mathematically the previous case that I was discussing. Where, where these were absent. And if I set to zero also scalar tensor, then I recover exactly standard model chi-square. So this is just more general. Okay, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, Orlando raised his hand again. I don't know if he's got another question. No. <laughs> okay, so I don't know if there's any other question uh, from, from the audience. I have a question Robert. for, for Martin. So very nice to talk. I, I was wondering uh, if with this procedure you can extract the energy dependence of the of the different Wilson coefficients. In the sense that depending on the experiment, maybe the, the coefficient may vary because of the energy scale of the of the experiment. So the coefficients themselves uh, do not, dip, so they are coefficients in a Lagrangian and then they do not depend on the energy. Now, what you can have is uh, in the EFT, uh, you have additional interactions which are with derivatives, which they would generate uh, energy dependencies in your observables. Uh, they are very suppressed because you know, the momentum transfer in these processes is very small. It's order one MeV. And compared with the neutron mass or nuclear mass, which is like three orders of magnitude more. Uh, so these are very small effects. But the precision is so high uh, that you can, you can actually try to look for them. Uh, this is, for instance, the so-called weak magnetism. And, and we're actually working in that direction. But these are small effects. So it's, it's difficult to, to probe them. But this does not mean that, uh, so let me clarify. So you, even neglecting all those terms, which is kind of all those BSM terms is justified to neglect them. The standard model derivative terms, you should be careful and keep them, even if they're small. Uh, but even, even in that situation, the leading new physics terms, all these coefficients, they will generate energy dependence behavior in the observables. So they are not energy dependent. They are quantities that are constant, but when you calculate the impact that they have on the observable, this is the first term, uh, for instance, uh, you see here. So they generate this term, which is energy dependent, but it's not because the, the Wilson coefficient themselves is energy dependent. Yeah, that, that I meant when, you minimize, you make the oh. best fit depending on the observable. Okay. May vary yeah. yeah, this is this is actually this energy dependence uh, that, that is here and in the end is the one uh, generating this the spectrum to, to change, or more importantly, this is this is crucial. Okay. This is uh, this is the energy dependency because when you integrate over the whole phase space, uh, since the phase space is different for each transition. Uh, this will generate a different effect at the end, okay? You get this, this uh, first term, which is constant and is universal, times the average of, of m over e. This average depends on the phase space and is transition dependent. And this is exactly the, why the fit is able to set strong constraints on, on these quantities. It's the main reason. So actually, I, when Robert asked his question, I thought that he meant uh, the, the energy dependence from the RG running, right? That the coefficients would depend on the scale that they're being evaluated. So I'm wondering if 
that, that made me think about about it because you you do include the the, the running. Yeah. So so if, if so if you're looking only at beta decays, then there is no run. I mean, the the energy is essentially the same for all of them. I mean, these these differences are too small for for anything like that. Now, mm -hmm. if you're going to compare these with LHC, then this becomes crucial because mm -hmm. you're running over three orders of magnitude. And I think, let me find it. Yeah, it's, uh, this is the result. So here you see, these are the, let's focus on the last one or, or even better on, on the scalar. The scalar interaction at two GeV. Right. Okay, when you run it, uh, or you try to connect it uh, with the scalar interaction, the same Wilson coefficient, but at the Z mass, the, you see it's this element, it's 1.7. So it's, the, the, it's not a small effect because th this is a QCD running. Mm -hmm. But this is actually the running of the quark masses. It's the same because the quark current is the same, it's a scalar current. So this was uh, studied to death, but uh, so it's known that it's a very large running. Uh, but it, it has to be taken into account because you see it's a factor of two almost. Um, and then you match, I mean, the idea of the FT, you take this Wilson coefficient, uh, which is the one that you constrain in beta decay, you run it through this equation to this scale. At this scale, you match to the next EFT, and then you translate it to these Wilson coefficients at that scale, and then you run again to one TV. Right which is the energy scale of the LHC process that you're studying. And the running again is, you know, 1.2, it's a 20% effect. Again, QCD. Uh, so, so this is important, yes. I don't know the, the, mixing, the mixing is, 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 sorry, the mixing is generated by, by weak interactions. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so small. It's 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus six. Or Some, ten to minus two. Yeah, that 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 caught my attention. Yeah, the, the yeah. To okay, two. The, and ten to minus two. But uh, mm -hmm. but this is uh, very important if you're, for instance, because it mix it mixes scalar and tensor with pseudo scalar, and the pseudo scalar mm -hmm. is the one that I said that is very strongly constrained from pi on the case. Uh -huh. And then this mixing, in other words, if you have a tensor interaction through loops, it would contribute to pi on the case. It would generate a pseudo-scalar interaction mm -hmm. that is highly constrained, and then that way you get a very, very strong constraint on, the, on this scalar on the tensor. Tensor interaction. On the, yeah. Great. Very interesting. So I don't know if there's any other question from, from the audience. Um, so so I have, let, let me see if there's any, okay, nothing from the YouTube. So, um, I was wondering when you add your right-handed neutrinos, you're, you're considering uh, Dirac uh, neutrinos, I guess, in the sense that I, I imagine that you take them all massless. Um, because if you have like, like Majorana right-handed neutrinos, you, th this could modify the determination of the Fermi constant. Right, because I, 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 I again imagine that the Fermi constant is determined by muon decay. Yeah, Fermi constant comes from muon decay. And this is, uh, I think in the language I was using, where is it? Um, here it is. So is this one over V squared? That's the Fermi constant. And it comes from muon decay. Yes, and it should be taken into account consistently because uh, you could have new physics affecting muon decay. And since you are in the EFT, you don't want to assume that those are zero. The whole idea is to keep everything general. And so that is, is uh, that should be taken into account. It's taken into account in the, in the whole approach. Um, now, the neutrinos, the mass of the neutrino is completely negligible for these processes that I'm discussing. So as far as I understand, is irrelevant whether the neutrino is Majorana or is Dirac. Now, it's a different story if you, for instance, decide to, in, to include Catherine, which is a beta decay, it's a tritium beta decay. Uh, so it, it belongs, it's actually it's a mirror decay. So it belongs to this discussion, but that measurement that is, has a very, very, very low endpoint, that's why it's chosen. And that one is sensitive to the mass of the neutrino, and then you have to make choices. But for the 
for the input that I'm using, the endpoints are not that low, and then mm -hmm. it's completely negligible. No, what, what I meant was that the, the, the right-headed neutrinos, they could have a larger masses than the, than the standard model neutrinos. Ah, if, they, if they're ah, Majorana, right? That, that's, yeah. that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yeah, sorry. If they have, yeah, then, then so the EFT, as I said, uh, because the EFT is advertised as model independent, but I like to say it's model independent, but not assumption independent. So it's, uh, there are some, and, and the crucial assumption is that there are no new light degrees of freedom. So if you have a new state, a new right-handed neutrino by which is with a mass, uh, which is significant, then you have to put it in the theory and, and that would, would have, uh, it's a different analysis. Right, right. So, so, so mainly that, that, okay, so with, with the, what, what I'm thinking, that would mean that there are Dirac neutrinos, uh, the, your, your right-handed ones, right? Because they have the same mass as the left-handed ones, I guess, I guess. Okay, okay, great, great. That, that's all something. Um, so, uh, and, and my, last, my, my last question, could you remind us, uh, why are the mirrors so important for constraining the, the couplings with right-handed neutrinos? Um, I, think, I, think the, I think the explanation is simple. Um, so I think you have, so you have essentially, uh, let me go back here. Um, yeah, this is what I'm saying here. So you have essentially two neutron measurement that are very precise, which is a neutron lifetime and this beta symmetry. Okay, those are very precise. Then you also have other neutron measurements, but they're not so, so, so precise. Uh, there is a good reason for this, right? Because those are the two you need to extract VUD so they have been more studied. Um, and I guess there are also experimental reasons, but these two are very precise, but these are just two, okay? Now, the super allowed decays, the corrected FT values, they are very precise uh, and you have many, but they all probe the same combination, okay? They all probe this first term, which is just scalar. It's, it's one, one combination of new physics. So in the end, it means that you have, uh, this probes v, the, the vector and the scalar, okay? Let me put it that way. So it means that you have four, essentially four super precise input in your data set, okay? So in, the, in this feed, in the standard model feed where you have only two couplings, there's no way to compete with those four for mirror decays. They're not so precise. They're very precise, but they're not so precise. Now, if you put four, Still, is four input for four couplings. So still, for them, it's very difficult <laughs> to compete. The moment you add one single additional I Wilson think. coefficient, then uh, it's not enough with these four. So then you don't have to compete with these four anymore. You have to compete with the rest. And the rest in our data set is not so precise. Mm -hmm. so at, but And especially if you put four more, not just one then yeah. the, the, the feed really needs help, so. Right, so even though they're not that precise, they, they, also, they also help. Yeah, because these are per mil level measurements. I mean, when yeah. we say they're not that precise, but they're per mil level, the thing is that these, <laughs> these decays are even below per mil. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, okay, now I, now I get it. Excellent. Um, so, so that's it. I don't know if there's any last questions from, uh, from the audience. We, we, we're, we're on time, um, but we could have one urgent question. Okay, apparently not. So there we go. Thank you very much, Martin, for this fantastic talk. My and, pleasure. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's been really great. Uh, let me uh, uh, remind everybody that we uh, continue with our webinars on the 27th of October. Um, I don't remember who, who, who was giving the webinar, Kathleen Schutz, maybe, I think. Um, so we'll see you there, okay? So take care, everybody, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay.